Um, so in the next part of his criticism, uh, Dr. Terry Jones states that um, because Muslims deny the crucifixion of Jesus, they uh, therefore are denied salvation. But what does Islam actually teach about the crucifixion of Jesus? Well, um, you know, it, it is, it teaches exactly in line with what the Bible says historically, that he was crucified. So let's see what the Holy Quran says. It says, so this is, you could say, the area of concern is what Allah tells us happened to Hazrat Jesus, peace be upon him. We agree that Jesus was put on the cross, that he was crucified. The, the issue is what does crucifixion mean and what does cru being crucified mean? It simply means that he was put up on the cross or a stake and he had to go through that horrific act of, uh, and torture, in fact, of being crucified. But what this ayat of the Quran is telling us, and I'll read the translation, whereas they slew him not, nor crucified him, but he was made to appear to them like one crucified. So it means that, he, you know, he went on the cross, he went through all the agony of being up on that cross, but he didn't come to the end action of that uh, crucifixion, it means he didn't die. So the Quran agrees in every respect that he was put on the cross, he was crucified, but he didn't die of that action. So the interesting thing is that there is a verse in, in the Bible, which I will show to you now, which actually supports this very uh, riot of the Quran, and this is from uh, Hebrews 5.7. This is a very uh, profound um, uh, statement from the Bible, and I, I will read it where it says, uh, it's in five, uh, Hebrews 5, 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Now this is very important, with loud cries and tears. To him, him means to God, who was able to save him, and he was heard for his godly fear. Now this is very important because there's three aspects to this. One, the intensity of his prayer. Two, he prayed to the only person who could have saved him, which was Almighty God and that his prayers were accepted because of his taqwa, because of his fear of God, because of his love of God. So according to this, uh, you know, passage of the Bible, he survived the crucifixion. So the Quran is in line with uh, the biblical historical facts. Thank you. And the second part of that is a view which is very common among Christians, which is that salvation can only come through belief in Jesus as the Son of God. Um, but as, as far as the Bible is concerned, does it, does it support that idea? No, I, I mean, of course, you, you, you have to understand one thing about the Bible. You have the four Gospels, then you have the letters of, of Paul and Acts and the epistles of Paul, I should say. In the Gospels itself, um, I don't find any evidence of that. And where, where, what I do find is in uh, the Gospel of Luke, um, uh, where Jesus was asked the very question about um, uh, the issue of eternal life. And th this is very important. This is in line with what John Gere had said earlier on um, about if Jesus came back today, what he would be asked and what he would say. Well, here he was asked how to attain eternal life. And I will just read it. Uh, it's, it's from the Gospel of Luke, and it's chapter 10, verse 25 to 28. And behold, an advocate stood up to him to test. The uh, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read? And he answered, you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he said, you have answered right. The advocate said this uh, to this. Jesus said, to this and you will live. Do this and you will live, I should say. So here there's no mention. Surely if, if, if Jesus knew that now the only way people were gonna get saved and get to have salvation was to believe on his death on the cross, he would have said, this is the only way to eternal life. But rather, he's given them that we have to be the commandments of God. So no, there's no, there's no uh, evidence in, in that. Thank you. And, um Jahangir Sahib, what does Islam actually believe as far as salvation is concerned? Um, is Islam the only route to salvation? No, interestingly not. 
Islam is said to be the, actually the religion of submission to Allah. And so all prophets of God were following that religion in one form or another. They were all submitting to the will of God in, in, and promoting peace. However, having said that, uh, the Holy Quran also acknowledges the fact that maybe there are people out there who have not, uh, to whom the message of Islam has not yet reached in a complete fashion or in a proper fashion and therefore they haven't accepted it. Will they be condemned because of that? Is that their fault? Well, the Quran says it's not their fault. And it actually says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَى وَالسَّابِئِينَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Which means that surely the believers, meaning the Muslims, and the Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabians, as Sabi'un in Arabic means any non-Abrahamic religion, so that will, you know, all the, that will cover all the other religions, whichever party from among these truly believes in Allah, in, in God, and the last day, and does good deeds, shall have their reward with their Lord, and no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. And that's in chapter 2, verse 63. So we see that any of these people, whether they be Muslims, Jews, Christians, or of any other religion, if they truly fear their Lord, and they therefore do good deeds, because they think they will have to reckon, there will be a reckoning for their deeds, therefore they behave correctly towards each other, they will have their reward of their Lord, that means they'll have salvation. So this is, in, Islam is in no way monopolizing the truth at all. It's a very generous uh, statement to make indeed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to point two uh, and point three, Terry Jones um, criticizes the, the Quran uh, here and uh, talks about how he doesn't believe that the Quran has an eternal origin, that it's not recorded in heaven, and that he believes that it has a, a, a human source and that we, we don't know where it's come from and it's a concoction of old and new, and new teachings. Um, but uh, Ibrahim Saab, you've studied the history of the Quran. Um, what do we actually know about the origins of the Quran? What we know from history is, is, is this, that during uh, the lifetime of uh, Hazrat Prophet Muhammad وسلم, number one, you had the companions, uh, some of them, uh, and many later on, but some in the early part of uh, the, the revelation of Quran, were hafizes of Quran. So you had people who had memorized the Quran from beginning to end. So they knew exactly how, how it came about. This is actually also uh, recognized by many non-Muslim scholars um, that, this is, that this is an academic fact. This actually happened. We also know that during the lifetime of Hadith Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and this is very important because uh, many uh, other uh, Christian scholars who may be of the same thinking as uh, Dr. Terry Jones, in, in his very book he mentions uh, the fact that uh, you know, the Quran you know, was a hundred and so many years later on. What we know is that, I mean, the Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Prophet Muhammad Sallam, used to recite them in Salat in the early part of his ministry, which shows they had really been revealed at that time. Of course, the other criticism that he has is that he, he claims that the Quran is, is of human origin. Um, of course, anyone who would just read the Quran, they could see that clearly it wasn't. Uh, but um, Jahangir Sahib, can you give us some examples of of uh, what tells us that it's not of human origin. Well, obviously human beings wrote, them, wrote the words down. But that goes for every text, doesn't it? However, for the Quran, we see often they'll say that uh, it's just plagiarizing texts of the Bible. And so therefore it's biblical text being taken in, in wholesale into the Quran. Had that been true, if the Bible had, had erred or had made any mistake, like for example, a historical mistake in, 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 any, in any respect, those errors we would, have, we would have expected to see them being carried forward as well. Strangely though, and luckily for us, the Qur'an actually corrects those mistakes whenever they appear. Now there were many examples of this, I'm just going to choose one today. There's one particular anachronism, in, uh, historical anachronism in the, uh, the uh, Bible, which is that it extends the Pharaonic uh, dynasty or the dynasty of the pharaohs of Egypt who were Egyptian rulers themselves, born and bred, uh, right up to the time of the Prophet Joseph. That now, we now know is historically wrong. Modern Egyptology tells us that the Pharaonic dynasty only appeared quite a while after the demise of uh, the Prophet Joseph, so he never met any Pharaoh himself. However, we will find that uh, 
in the Bible, it seems that the pharaohs still ex were already in existence then, and we know now that's, that's not correct. As we see, for example, in Genesis 41, uh, verses 15 and 16, we see that, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a, a dream. In verse 16, we see Joseph answered Pharaoh. So there, therefore, Pharaoh is there. But at the time of Joseph, actually, it wasn't even Egyptians who were ruling over the, the area where J uh, Joseph was. It was the Hyksos people, it was the Semitic people, a non-Egyptian people who had invaded and who were very tolerant. And uh, therefore, we see the movement of the, the, the uh, children of Israel into Egypt because they were in, in coming into a tolerant society. But now, in the Quran, we would expect to see, therefore, the word Pharaoh in res uh, with respect to Joseph appear, but it doesn't. The Quran mentions the ruler, the Egyptian ruler at the time of Moses, may peace be upon him, many times. Every time it correctly calls him Pharaoh or Pharaoh. But when it mentions the ruler at the time of Joseph, it calls him Al-Malik, the king. Now why that fine distinction? Now the Holy Prophet Muhammad said, may peace be upon him, this knowledge does not come from me. This comes from the Lord on high. And indeed, how could an Arab, an illiterate Arab, who couldn't even read or write, in the middle of the desert in the 6th and 7th centuries, how could he have known that, where the, whereas the only available material to him would have been the biblical one? How did he correct that, that, uh, that mistake? Now, one other thing I'd like to, to, to throw at the, the viewers here is that uh, it's been said, and this is the, the whole reason why the Qur'an is, is, is uh, proposed to be, to be earned here, uh, that the Qur'an is from the devil, that Islam is, God forbid, from the devil. Now, this is a passage from the Qur'an, and I would like to ask the viewers to reflect on this and see whether themselves could ever believe that the devil could, could reveal this to anybody. And it is, O ye men, eat of what is lawful and good in the earth and follow not the footsteps of Satan. Surely he is to you an open enemy. He only enjoins upon you what is evil and what is foul, and that you say of God what you do not know. And that's in uh, verses 169 and 170 of, of the second chapter of the Quran. Does this come from Satan? Well, that's, that's in, again, very, very interesting. Um, in the next part of his criticism, uh, Dr. Jones uh, states that he believes that the Quran, uh, the Quranic teachings include Arabian idolatry and, and paganism. And as far as my knowledge is concerned, the Quran completely rejects uh, idolatry. Um, Ibrahim Saab, what? Absolutely. What do we I have mean, uh, this is just amazing. Just the last ayat of Quran that uh, Jangir has mentioned. I mean, you find this again and again in the Quran. This is the very accusation against uh, by Dr. Terry Jones that the Quran somehow encourages or Muslims have been commanded in some way or another to be idol worshippers. Whereas what we find uh, actually in the Quran is um, it's in, uh, I'll just get the verse for you now. It's, uh, it's again, Surah Al-Hajj 22 verse 31. The very last part where Allah makes uh, a command, uh, you can, an, an intense you know, admonishing the Muslims, sh you know, shun therefore the abomination of idols and shun all words of untruth. So how is it possible when a Muslim reads this, he knows or she knows that she can't be worshipping anything other than Almighty Allah